Good morning, church. Would you stand and join us today? Good to see you here this morning as we gather together to worship our Lord this morning as we celebrate the first advent of our King and as we await the hope of his second advent and uh, his eventual reign over us. And we're just so excited about that. And so we just want to welcome you here as we worship. If this is your very first time uh, worshiping with us here at St. Paul's and our family at St. Paul's, especially want to welcome you and thank you for worshiping with us. There's a connection card found in front of you. That's a way for you to communicate with us anything that you uh, need as far as prayer or praise or if it's your first time for us to get to just know who you are. And so we'd love for you to fill that out and drop that in one of the buckets uh, for the offering as you walk out of the back of the sanctuary this morning. And so we just want to make sure we take 
take care of that. We do want to let you know about two really quick things uh, as we think about just our schedule this week. First, we want to remind you that uh, tonight is Junior Youth's Christmas party. And so if you have kids between the grades three and eight, that's an opportunity for your kids to come out and enjoy some pizza, some movies, uh, some games and different things like that. Again, it starts at uh, five o'clock this evening in the social hall. And so we want you to come out to that, have fun uh, as kids celebrating Christmas and things. It gives you parents maybe two hours to do some shopping or something like that, uh, or go out to dinner, or just be kid-free, right? Uh, And so we want to invite you back here at 5 o'clock, kids, uh, grades 3 through 8. And then we want to remind you that next week, if you look out on the Welcome Center, next week is our Christmas caroling, where we're just going to go around and spread the joy of Christmas and and glorify the Lord by knocking on doors and singing songs to people 6 to 8 next uh, Sunday night. There's a sign-up on the uh, Welcome Center. We'd love for you to sign up there just so that we have a count and we know how many leaders we need. Uh, Sign up there. And you can also pick up your tickets for Christmas Eve for our 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock services for Christmas Eve. We are here to worship, to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to talk about peace. And so as we think about peace, I'm going to invite the swan kids to come forward as we light the Advent wreath and as we get ready for worship this morning. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. John 14, 27. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Isaiah 26, 3. Christmas 2020. Most likely it will look different this year. COVID has complicated our lives and attempted to compromise our peace. Jesus came to give us his gift of perfect peace. Let's take all cares, whatever is squashing our peace, to Jesus. Let's talk to him about it, trust him with it, and watch how he displaces our concerns and fears with his peace. On the second Sunday of Advent, let us light this candle with a new commitment to gaze with fully trusting hearts into the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the only Prince of Peace. Let's pray together as we worship this morning. Father God, we are uh, so grateful that even in the midst of chaos and frustrating circumstances, God, we can find peace in you. And so this morning, God, as we worship, we just ask that you would manifest your presence in this place, that Holy Spirit, you would have your will and way in us this morning, and that today, God, today as we worship, we would be changed, we would be challenged, that, Lord, we would leave this place excited about our God, our King, our Savior, who gives that perfect peace, that this Christmas, we would not only live with peace, but we would tell others of the great peace that we have because of Jesus. So may you be worshiped now, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, and let's continue to worship. Baby 
speaks for the voiceless, hope for the hopeless, Emmanuel. One love brings us together. start in me let there be peace let it start in me Sing it louder. Cause nothing. 
nothing has the power to save but your name.
adore you With angels above we bow down before you The light of your love shines bright On this holy night Your love shines bright That's why we worship you. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we celebrate Advent, Christmas. It's not because of us, God. We're not here for us. We're here for you. We're here to declare your goodness. We're here to praise and worship you, our God, our King, our Savior. And so this morning, we pray that you would just help us to worship well. That now as we move into worship through your word, that you would again just speak to us. That you would remind us what you desire of us and the promises that hold true because of who you are, because you are a God who is always faithful. Even when we are not, you are always faithful. So we praise you, God. May you be worshiped this morning. Please, please, God, we just ask that you would be with those individuals that aren't here this morning, that are just struggling, that are hurting. Lord, would you be just ever close to them? Would you give them healing? Would you provide for them? Would you give them protection? Uh, Lord, would you reassure them not only of your love, but our love and just uh, how grateful we are of, uh, for them, God. And so, God, just help us now as a family, whether we're virtual or here. God, help us as a family to fall at the feet of our God and King, to hear your voice and to know your will and to live obediently for, for you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time you may be seated, and our kids are dismissed to junior church as they have the opportunity to go and learn more with their friends so they can go out. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Isaiah uh, chapter 9 this morning as we talk about peace, uh, as we have the opportunity to continue in this series as we've entitled it Simple Christmas as we look at this idea of just how busy Advent has become, how busy Christmas is, and how we often run around like um, crazy people trying to, to fulfill the lists and the wants and all of these different things. Uh, and not that that's a bad thing. We love giving gifts, and, and we're grateful for Christmas and the, the ability to bless others. And yet, we want to remind you of the simplicity of the message of Christmas. And so if you were with us last week, we had the opportunity to look at the, the simple truth of hope and the hope that we have in Christ as we looked at Isaiah chapter 11 and as we uh, considered this whole idea that we have hope not only for today because of uh, his uh, forgiveness of our sins and a right relationship with God the Father, but hope for uh, all eternity as we are reminded and are awaiting the second coming of Christ. This morning, we're going to look at this idea of peace. But before we get there, I just want to uh, give you some, some neat information and just kind of celebrate with you. I think as, a, as the people of God, so often we don't do a very good job at celebrating. We're really good at, at praying and, and worshiping and things, but we don't celebrate too often. And I think it's important to draw attention 
to what God is doing in and through our church and just want to celebrate some things. And so uh, this, this week, we're so excited to be able to let you know that uh, on Tuesday, the executive committee, meaning the, the president, uh, Ken Rathman, and the vice president, Bruce Sensnig, and uh, Crystal um, Sensnig, our treasurer, and myself, we're going to be traveling on Tuesday, and we're going to be signing the final paperwork to purchase the nine and a half acres uh, next to our property uh, on Tuesday. And so we're just really excited about what God is doing uh, in and through our church family here. Uh, and we're excited about what he's going to do in the future. You know, one of the things that, that people have asked is like, what's next? And I'm going, that's a great question. Uh, the great truth is that we don't need to know what's next because our God does, right? And so we're just trying to be faithful in the midst of all of this, but we're just really excited to just say, keep praying because this Tuesday, we're going to take ownership of that. And, and so um, that, that is uh, something, that obviously, that we then have to, we have to pay for. Uh, but as, as uh, we think about that, I also want to celebrate the fact that because of your generosity and because of God's faithfulness uh, through you, uh, we've made the decision because of the surplus that we have. You know, we talk about surplus here and how God has continued to bless because of your generosity. Uh, what are we going to do with all of these things? And so we want to let you know that as we go to sign... The ministry council talked about it and prayed over it, and although we had said you know, before we weren't going to do a down payment, we decided we're going to do a down payment of $50,000 because we have the ability to do that. And so we're going to pay down $50,000 of it immediately because if we do that, well, then we can save at least $20,000 of just interest alone. Right, And so we're really excited about doing that. Uh, and that doesn't even touch what's in the capital fund and all of those things. We still have the ability to do renovations and things here. And so we're just really grateful for your generosity. And we just want to celebrate what God is doing through the family of St. Paul's here. Now, some of you have said to, to me, you know, can we give specifically to that? We didn't do a capital campaign because we don't want to stress you out and we don't want to um, you know, push too much because we know that eventually, hopefully, we're going to have to build a building on, on, on that property or do something uh, bigger on that property as our family grows. And so we haven't done that. But if you have like end of the year giving and you're saying, I want to be able to give to the purchase of the land because we'd like to see this paid down quickly, uh, there are some envelopes out in this information rack. Just see our Welcome Center uh, volunteers and they'll get you those envelopes. They say building fund on them, and you can literally just cross that out and put land purchase and put whatever in that and drop that in the offering, and it'll get taken care of. Again, that is no pressure, but just if you have that kind of on your heart that you wanted to do that, we would love for you to help us because we want to get this paid down so we can keep doing what God's calling us to do, and that's to use this land and to glorify the Lord and to help our community come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so that's what we're all about here, and we're just excited about what God's doing. Uh, and so this week's a celebration, a celebration of what God has been doing and what he will do in our future. So let's pray together as we go before God's word and as we jump into time in God's word. Father, we celebrate you. God, this land, it is not ours. Sure, it might say St. Paul's on the deed, but really it's yours, God. It's your property. And so, Father, with grateful hearts, we just say thank you, and we beg of you, God, give us a vision for the future. Whatever you want, just help us to know what you want us to do, and just give us the will to say, whatever you desire, God, we'll do it. Help us just to be faithful and obedient to your will. We are so excited that you want to use us to impact this community, and so, God, help us to see what that means with this property, and to just faithfully and obediently put our heads down and go after that task. And now, God, as we jump into your word, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. Father, I'm not good enough to do this. And so, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would, you would take over, that these would be your words and not mine, and that this morning we would grow in understanding, that we would grow in a desire to worship, and that we would leave this place excited to go and tell of the Prince of Peace. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, again, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to skip kind of around to different spots as we think about this idea of Prince of Peace. You heard this morning as the swan children uh, were, were reading for us and lighting the Advent uh, wreath so well about this idea that, that the COVID, you know, has kind of disturbed our peace. I don't know about you, but, uh, but I think we need an extra dose of peace. And this morning, I'm excited to be able to read with you and to learn with you from Isaiah and others. 
about the peace that is offered to us as we celebrate Advent, as we recognize the gift of the coming of our Messiah. So if we look at Isaiah chapter 9, it's kind of like a, it's a precursor to Isaiah 11. If you were with us last week, we looked at Isaiah chapter 11 and this whole idea of the stump of Jesse. Do you remember this? The stump of Jesse and how the people of Israel had walked away from God to a place where God eventually had to cut down that tree until new life, the branch, the shoot, Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, would come out of that stump and invade time and space. Right and rule and reign. And so as we looked at that, we recognize that Isaiah chapter 9 comes before that. This is a passage that probably, if you've ever worshipped around Christmas Eve uh, or, or thought about uh, Advent and have a church background, you've, you've heard this passage, this passage that, that sounds like this. Read this with me. Uh, let me read this over you, I should say. It says this, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. This is, like I said, as I said, this is probably one of the most classic Advent uh, readings. If you've ever been in a church setting, you've probably heard this. And, And as we read there, what we see is this idea of that new shoot, the Messiah, and the names that Jesus would have. Now, we recognize... That as we read this and we see all of those different names, names, names like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, these weren't names that were necessarily used for Jesus as he, as he lived on earth, right? It's not like Joseph as he was coddling, you know, uh, baby Jesus was sitting there and he's like, how you doing, Everlasting Father? Prince of Peace, you know, it's so good to hold. He didn't, he didn't use those names. Well, we recognize that the prophet Isaiah, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these names down to communicate to us and the people of Israel the coming of the Messiah and the promise of the Messiah and who he would be, the, the attributes of this God-man. Right, the Messiah, God Himself in human flesh, and we read there. I wish we had enough time to to kind of like read through and and and, and work through all of the different names. We don't, otherwise we would not end on time. I ended early. I just want that written down. I ended early in the first service. That never happens. Never. If you don't worship here normally, I apologize. I'm sometimes long winded. Um, but but so you know, I don't have enough time to go through all of those names. But what we recognize is as we see those names is we see that Jesus himself, God in human flesh, he is going to come and he's going to be a counselor. Right? He's going to be a counselor. He's going to rule with d- divine wisdom and understanding. He's going to be a man of discernment. That he's going to be strength, right? mighty God. He's going to be full of strength and power to be able to do the will of God. That he has this divine nature being the everlasting father. He's going to rule for eternity. But they all culminate, they all come together in Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. That's the one that is so important. And that's the one we want to focus in on this morning. So if you look there and you see Prince of Peace, you're not going to see this in Isaiah chapter 9. But if you, if you would turn to an original manuscript of the, the prophet Isaiah's word, you would see in Hebrew that that word, Prince of Peace, or those two words, uh, is Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. It's, it's Prince, Prince meaning royalty, royal son, and Peace. Peace, right? How do you define peace? When you think about peace, how would you define it? You know, for all of us, you know, 2020 has been an odd year. It's been a crazy year. And for many of us, we're like, uh, yes, peace, I'll take an extra dose right now. You know, but what do you think of? When you think of peace, what do you think of? For me, uh, I go to two memories when I think uh, of peace. You know, if we, if we think of, of, of peace in the English language, what we do is, is we are reminded or we think of this idea of kind of like a, an absence of conflict, right? That's how you would define it in the English language. Uh, if you look it up, actually, it's, uh, it's defined as an absence uh, of, of conflict or disturbance or uh, a state of tranquility or being without war or conflict. And so when I think about peace and I think about that definition, I think of two things they co- that come to mind. First is the 1980s song, Do They Know It's Christmas? Anybody? Yeah? 
You grew up in the 1980s, you know that song? Like this, this uh, conglomeration of all these like, great singers and stuff. If you don't know that, you gotta look it up. YouTube, it's wonderful, it's awesome, right? And they're singing together and they're celebrating Christmas. And, and they, they talk in that song about peace. One line is about peace. I've been singing the bridge and chorus of that song wrong for 39 years. I've been living a lie, right? I thought it was peace on earth. Do they know it's Christmas? It's feed, it's feed the world. It's not, it has nothing to even do with peace. So when I think about peace, I think this song that I've been singing wrong. Now, that's not an unusual thing. If you watch us in worship, I sing songs, even though they're on the screen, wrong all the time, and Emily will hit me. Just watch. She'll, she'll hit me because I do it all the time. I just look over and I giggle and I'm like, okay, there it happened again. No big deal. We'll get over it. So first I think of, of the 1980s song, Do They Know It's Christmas? And hopefully that song is stuck in your head the rest of the day. The second thing I think of is when I was in, at Carnarvon Elementary School in Lancaster County here. And growing up and the United States was involved in the Persian Gulf conflict. Do you remember those days? where our, our country was just thrown into turmoil and craziness. And I can remember standing in the gym, gym slash cafeteria of my elementary school, and kids holding American flags and saying, peace in the Middle East, right? Because we just wanted our, we just wanted our family and friends and loved ones to come home from that conflict. But does peace really mean when we see peace, peace, a uh, prince of peace? Is that what we mean? Is that what, is that what God meant when he called Jesus the prince of peace? A prince that would bring an absence of conflict or an absence of, of disturbing circumstances or he would bring tranquility. Is that what, is that what Jesus' job was? Well, if we look there at Sar Shalom, Shalom itself does not mean a, a, an absence of conflict or an absence of disturbing uh, circumstances or situations, that actually means wholeness, completeness, right? And so if you go to Israel now today, modern-day Israel, if you would walk into Jerusalem and you would walk around, you would uh, greet somebody by saying shalom. What you're saying to them is, hello, peace be with you, wholeness be with you. You can actually say bye. It's kind of like going to Hawaii. Ever, anybody ever go to Hawaii? And they say aloha to, to hello and goodbye. It's the same word. Shalom in Israel is the same word. But it doesn't mean may you walk and may you be undisturbed. It's may, may you have wholeness. May you have completeness in who you are. And so as we read here in Isaiah chapter 9, what we read is of a God who sends his only begotten son, the prince, God himself in human flesh, to bring wholeness and completeness to the people of God who recognize who he is, submitting their lives to him, that they would have completeness and wholeness, not an absence of just disturbing circumstances, but wholeness in their souls. And it's tied, it's linked directly to, to how he will rule and reign. So if you look at, at verse 7, we often kind of skip past verse 7 whenever we read this. But if you look back there at verse 7, this is what it says. His government, that is the Messiah's, Jesus, his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So not only is he a prince, but as a prince, he will sit on the throne, he will sit on the judgment throne, and he will bring wholeness, completeness, and it will be full and finished and good. This is our God and King. So as we celebrate Advent, what we're doing is we're celebrating Advent and recognizing that peace and peace alone can only be found in Jesus, right? That, that if you go to Google today and you search inner peace on Google, in 10 hundredths of a second, 168 million things come up. I didn't look at all of them, I promise. 168 million. Why? Because our culture, our society, our world says that if you want peace, if you want an absence of conflict or disturbing or frustrating circumstances in your life, the place to find it is in you. It's in who you are. It's in your own being. That if you just sit long enough and meditate long enough, or if you just kind of get rid of the disturbing or frustrating relationships in your life, good luck with that. 
you'll find tranquility. You'll find peace. You'll find an absence of conflict. And yet, Jesus comes as the prince, the one who will sit on the throne, and he says, I'm not here to bring you just tranquility. I am here to bring you wholeness and completeness. And it's not found in you, it's found in me. If you would simply submit your lives to me. The prophet Zechariah would write in Zechariah 9, 9 to 10, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on, the, on, a, colt's, on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. This is our God. This is our Messiah. He comes not just to end wars, as nice as that would be. He comes to give peace, to give wholeness and fullness and completeness to those that would turn their lives over to him and submit their lives to him as Lord of their lives, that no matter where you are on earth, that no matter who you are, you would find true everlasting peace in him. The peace that we are truly looking for, it is only found in Jesus. It's not found in all this other stuff that we look at. It's not found in the things that we own, the material wealth that we have. I mean, we recognize that there's even pastors or teachers or other people that supposedly teach the gospel that says, well, if, if you serve God, he'll give you peace, he'll give you wealth, he'll give you riches, he'll do all of these things, and your life will be perfect. And yet we recognize that that's not the, that's not the truth, that's not the case, that's not the gospel. Jesus has come as the Prince of Peace, that you would turn to him and find wholeness, completeness in the rock of our salvation, in who he is and nothing else. Right? That's what Advent is all about. It's not about the absence of war and conflict as much as we'd like those things. It's not about inner peace. It's about turning to Jesus Christ. It's about recognizing that only in him can we find that wholeness, that completeness. He talks about this with his disciples, with his friends in John chapter 16. If you turn to the gospel of John chapter 16, I'd love for you to turn there with me. We see there in verses 31 through 33 an interaction with Jesus and his followers that I think really shows what we mean by this whole idea that it's found in Jesus, even in the midst of, of chaotic circumstances and situations. Right, so if you look there in John chapter 16, uh, and you start there in verse 29, and we're going to jump down to 31 on the screen, but if you look at verse 29, we recognize that what he is doing is he's about to tell his disciples that he is going to be crucified, that he is going to be killed, that he is going to die for their sins. And rather than using parables and other things like that that he, talked, that, that he used to talk to his followers, he finally is speaking plainly. And we see there in verse 29, they're like, finally, we understand what you're saying. We get it. It makes sense to us. And we see him say these words in, in, verse, in verses 31 through 33. Look there with me. It says this. Jesus asked, do you finally believe? But then the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So let's stop here for just a second. I, you know, I think sometimes when we come before the New Testament, sometimes when we come before um, Jesus' life, his ministry, we have kind of this um, almost uh, built-in sense that we kind of read out the emotion of what's happening here, of, of how Jesus is interacting with these men, with his closest followers, Right? We, we read it as if Jesus is talking to his followers, and it's like, hey, by the way, just so you know, like, I'm about to be crucified, I'm going to die. I know that, and so eh, it's not that big of a deal. And we read here, even in John chapter 16, like he's talking to his best friends, these people who he spent time with. I mean, think about his disciples. Jesus found his disciples, and he called them away from businesses, from families, 
from areas where they grew up and lived, and they were homeless with him for three years during his ministry. They lived with him, they slept near him, they ate food with him, they did everything with Jesus. And yet we read this as if when he says, by the way, you're all going to be scattered and you're all going to leave me and I'm going to be all by myself. It's just like, no big deal, I'm good, I'll be totally fine. Imagine what Jesus is feeling here. And think, of, think about your friendships. I don't know if you have a friend like this. Uh, if you don't have a friend like this, you need to find one right now. A friend that you can confide in. A friend that you share your, your finances with and you talk to financial stuff about. You talk about marriage about. You talk about, there are no secrets. You have a friend like that? Right? Like, I'm not even talking about in your marriage. I'm talking about outside of that. Do you have a friend like that that you can just sit with and confess with and talk with and just share the junk of life with? That was the disciples. And now Jesus is about to go and give his life for them. And he looks at them and he says, you are all going to leave me. You're all going to run away from me. Some of you are even going to deny knowing who I am. And yet, look at what he says. He says there, yet I am not alone Because the Father is with me, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. So that you may have shalom, wholeness, completeness in me. Here on earth, he says, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus' friends are about to run away from him, deny him. He's about to give his life. And instead of worrying about himself, he turns to his friends and he says, I love you, and I love you so much. I want you not to be anxious about anything. I don't want you to have to worry about our relationship. I am here to give you wholeness and and completeness. Your life is going to be filled with sorrow and brokenness and hardship. But don't worry about it. Why? Because I am peace itself. I am the prince of peace. The Advent season, the Advent of Jesus, it offers us peace amidst the chaos of life. Anybody feel like life's falling apart right now? Like no matter what you do, it's just like, I I just can't win? Jesus turns to his disciples and says, look, you're going to experience all sorts of hard stuff. I mean, think about Peter. A guy who turns away from the Lord, denies knowing the Lord, runs away from the Lord, comes back to him, preaches the gospel, and brings all of these people to the Lord. And what happens? He's crucified upside down. Does that sound like an absence of conflict and disturbance and all of those things? No. And yet Jesus looks him in the face and says, I tell you all of this so that you would have peace, so that you would have wholeness and completeness in me. No matter what's happening in your life, I am the foundation of that peace, he says. That you would not have to worry or be anxious about anything. That's what we're longing for, right? That's that's what we're longing for. That's what we celebrate a lot of times. We're longing for a sense of peace that we don't have to worry about anything. I mean, if you talk to any sort of a doctor or or a psychiatrist, anxiety levels, specifically even during the the pandemic, are through the roof. Why? Because we're longing for peace, but we're looking everywhere else for it. And the peace that we need, it's only found in Jesus. And Jesus doesn't come to us and say, look, if you believe in me, I'll take away all of this. I'll I'll, I'll give you the biggest house. I'll give you the biggest, you know, bank account. And I'll do all of these other things. That's not the gospel. Jesus says, in the midst of this suffering, I'll give you peace. In the midst of this brokenness, I'll give you peace. In the midst of the hard stuff, I will not leave you. C.S. Lewis described it this way. Life with God is is not immunity from difficulty but peace in difficulties. That's what Jesus does for us. That's why he came. The prophet Isaiah would write about it this way. When we feel like he's left us and he's gone away, he reminds us that he's never left when he says, but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I have called you by 
name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. This is our God. The Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of wholeness and completeness, no matter what the outside circumstances are. He says, I will not let you drown. I will not let you get consumed in the flames. I will be right there with you. I have not left you. A number of years ago, I was a youth pastor. Feels like forever ago. And sometimes I think I'd like to go back, and then I'm around teens, and I'm like, nope, not, don't want to do it. Right? We have a daughter that's 12, and I'm like, I'm already praying for Brad and Kayla. I'm like, please, dear Lord Jesus. A number of years ago, though, I was a youth pastor. I had this awesome youth leader. Her name was Kathy. Kathy was uh, a really quiet woman of faith. She wasn't that youth leader that was like all crazy playing games and going nuts with the teens. I mean, you need those people, don't get me wrong. But you also need those quiet presence kind of people who just sit there and share faith. God's word, just hear kids. Kathy was that person. She was awesome. I'll never forget sitting with her after she left the gro- for the grocery store, and while she was away at the grocery store, her son, who dealt with depression for years, decided to take his own life. I sat with her in her brokenness. I mean, what do you say? What do you say to that? I know the truths of God's word. I know the promises that God will never leave us or forsake us. I know that God is, in fact, the prince of peace. What do you say, though? She turned to me when I was talking to her, and she said, you know what, Matt? Through it all, I have peace. Why? Was it the absence of conflict? Was it the absence of sorrow and grief? It was the presence of Jesus, the prince of wholeness and completeness of shalom who gave her that peace. That is who we worship. Or another good friend of mine. He had two daughters in college. I have three kids, I'm not even paying for college yet, and I'm stressed out, right? Two daughters in college, he walks into my office and he says, hey, I just wanna let you know, like, I was with this company for a long time and they just let me go. I was like, are you kidding? The craziest thing is, is that friend, he looked at me and I said to him, what are you gonna do? He said, God's got it. Just had this big smile on his face. He said, God's got it. I'm going to be totally fine. We totally fine. We will be okay. In two weeks, he had a job. Everything was fine. It was like, now, is that because he knew he was going to get a job in two weeks? No. It was because his faith was built on the Prince of Peace. That in the midst of brokenness and frustrating circumstances and all of those things, and we all experience it, he said, none of that matters. Because my God is bigger than those things. And he gives me peace. Jesus would say it this way in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27. He says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. This world cannot give us the peace that we are longing for. It is only Jesus that can give us this peace. That in the midst of all of these crazy circumstances will overwhelm our hearts and minds and cause us to look and say, my God has this.
This is our God. And it's not only a peace for now, it's a peace for all eternity. If you look at John chapter 16, John chapter 16, this is what Jesus says in verse 33 as we get ready to close this morning. And we think about not only being reminded of the peace that he offers in the chaos of life, but the peace he offers for the promise of eternity. He says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? I have overcome the world. I have taken care of it. And so whether you find yourselves in brokenness and deep sorrow and grief now, may you have peace. And even if that peace, even if those difficult situations never leave you, may you have peace in those situations and may you recognize that one day you will rule and reign with me, that you will be with me for all eternity. That because of my willingness to come and take on human flesh, to give my life for you, I will promise that peace forever. I was listening to Ravi Zacharias the other day. I do that. I know I talk about that all the time. In the midst of moving boxes and doing all these different things, I put earbuds in and I listen to sermons. So that way, hopefully, I don't focus on all the stuff I have to do. And uh, Ravi Zacharias shared this excerpt from this poem by James Russell Lowell that I think speaks so perfectly. That if you're struggling with peace, I pray this speaks to you this morning. James Russell Lowell wrote it this way, truth forever is on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. We may feel as if in the midst of the brokenness, God has left us. The words, the beautiful words of this poem remind us our God standeth right next to us, beside us, in front of us, behind, in the unknown. He is right there. He's never left. That we would recognize that he is the Prince of Peace. That no matter what the world says they can give us, it doesn't add up. Jesus, he is our shalom. Father, I praise you and thank you this morning for the gift of peace. That we get the opportunity to call you prince of peace. That we get to call you savior, lord, and yes, even friend. My prayer this morning, God, is that as we sing, as we close that as we leave that Lord if we're struggling this morning that you would just help us Father God that whether it's through those two illustrations or whether it's through the truths of your word whatever it may be that you would just help us to draw back to this realization that Jesus you alone are the Prince of Peace that only in you are we ever going to find this calmness of heart in the midst of the chaos of life and so would you allow your peace to reign in this place to reign in the hearts and minds of us as individuals in a corporate body, that we would know your wholeness and completeness and that we then would go and share it with our friends who deeply need it. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
we wouldn't just say come and see but let me tell you what God has done that you may know it that you may too experience that peace that passes all understanding we love you Father we praise you and we thank you help us now to go and not only to live in peace but to be a people who take forward the message of peace we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for so much for worshiping with us. We're going to ask that you have a seat and invite our ushers to come and dismiss you. We pray that you have a fantastic week.